What's up everybody? I wanted to make a new type of video today. Uh, this is a video that I've been wanting to do for a while. I've been workshopping a little bit on what to put in here. One thing that did stop me from doing that was because I was doing my reviews of books and because TV Tropes is a website that is very much in English and there isn't so much uh, Brazilian Portuguese presence. So I didn't know exactly how alienating to my viewers it would be. But now that I'm making videos in English, I don't think this will be a problem anymore. So I have decided to talk a little bit about my favorite and least favorite tropes of all time. One day I might do an update on this list. I mean, this list has been updated pretty recently. I will talk more about that later in the video. And there's always a possibility that I might discover new things that I like, new things that I hate, or just change my mind. But I don't think this list is completely useless. I do want you to meet a little bit more about me and a little bit more about my tastes. I think this will shed on a little bit of light about what kind of things I like, about kind of things I dislike, and my opinions on media. And also, it can be fun! Who doesn't like complaining? So obviously this list is my opinion, but I will try my best to objectively argue over why I don't like these tropes. I'm not going to spend my time doing this video, I'm just gonna be like, hey, this is just my opinion, don't shit on me, uh, nothing I say has any value. Like you know, that person. And also many of these things I think you will agree with me that are kind of cliche, kind of played out. So I don't expect a lot of disagreement over this video, but as always, feel free to comment down below what you think are good, is bad, what you think I got wrong, and you have a nice civil discussion, why not? Also, as a side note, not all tropes are tropes, as in they have a page being a trope, it's just things that happen in stories. I am a huge fan of animation. I think that as a medium, it has the biggest potential in filmmaking. You can literally reshape words and people and just basically do whatever you want, if you have the means, of course. And there is just so many wonderful types of animation up there. There is stop motion, CGI, 2D, etc, etc. And one of the things that animation can do that is absolutely unique to it are animating expressions that cannot exist in real life. So you have many types of exaggerated expressions out there. You have the Looney Tunes ones, you have the anime, but my favorite are the expressive masks. This one I actually started enjoying before I got into comics, which might be a little bit surprising, but I did notice how great they were when I was watching the Spider-Man movie. Jesus, that movie is amazing. And the eyes of the characters just keep moving, they're just so expressive, even when the mask is covering the entire face. So I end up really enjoying this kind of character design, especially when the mask doesn't have any pupils, it's just white. I think that my only complaint about the Incredibles is the fact that you can see their eyes is not as expressive and cartoony. When you go watch Teen Titans and Robin is sad and his mask actually curves, it's it's great, that's that cinema. Batman the Animated Series also does this as well, you have Batman has these little triangles which is serious but he can also emote with them, it's, it's great. I love this character design, it's just It's the chess mastermind. It's not the chess master, it's something different. I'm talking specifically about when a villain or a hero does a monologue or explains something he's, he's playing and he's playing chess. That is so cliche. If you put this in your show, I will not pay attention to anything that's happening. Oh, because the enemy has made this move, but I'm going to sacrifice the pawns to protect the queen and put their king in checkmate. What are you talking about? You don't know what these terms mean. You're just trying to chip way to some smart and so cliche that it doesn't work. I wouldn't even have this problem if it were a different game. I was reading this comic that a character was doing his evil monologue and explaining his plan and he was actually doing crosswords. That was great. Why can't more people do that? I think I should probably explain a little bit better what I mean by my favorite tropes and least favorite tropes. What I mean by least favorite tropes isn't the worst things I have ever seen in a work. 
I, for example, would rather watch a villain giving a speech over a chess set than watch a movie that is openly racist and anti-vax, for example. But you see, even when you work with that kind of discourse and horrible stuff, you can't really say that the world would be better without it and no one should do it anymore. Because, for example, if you are making a work about racism, then you kind of need someone to be racist. So you can say that portraying racism in your movie is bad. So when I say my least favorite tropes, I do mean that simple things that you see in a movie and you just want to take them out of existence. You know, taking this party ending and shooting in the head. In pretty much the same way, there are things that I like more than these tropes. I, for example, I am a fan of many different genres of media, like for example dystopias, that would probably count as one of my favorite tropes. However, dystopias can be done poorly, and just because something is a dystopia doesn't mean that I'm going to get really excited over it, because there are dystopias that I don't like, which are, for example, those mutant metaphors for racism. When I say my favorite tropes, I'm talking about stuff that doesn't matter how bad the work is, I see that and I go I am saying this because I'm not a fan of romance, so I don't go out of my way to look for movies with this trope. But romance pops up everywhere, including all the shows and movies, so everyone has their favorite romance tropes, even if they're not a fan of the genre. You just can't escape love, it will pursue you for the rest of your life. So what is my favorite romance trope? Honestly, it's kind of hard to explain. It's like when two characters are terrible people, but they just work really well together. They work genuinely well and they do fit together. They are terrible people, but they belong with each other. It's possible that they are toxic to everyone else around them, especially if they have children. I actually really loved the parents as a couple in Arrested Development and the fact that they broke up is the reason I didn't watch the last season. You're angry. You've ruined us. I've ruined us? You got a lot of nerve, honey. The millions you pissed away on clothing and jewelry and the spa treatments. Yes, to keep you interested in the only thing you ever appreciated, my body. Can I help you? You got a fantastic body. And you're as powerful as a bear. My husband, the bear. This bear needs some honey wash. God, I missed you. I just really like that dynamic because it feels so less boring. You have the characters that are cute and they love each other, they are perfect. And on the other hand, you have the fucking train wrecks of people. They just are terrible. They are the worst people ever. But they have such a great romantic relationship. When I watched The Office, for example, I wasn't so interested in Jim and Penn. I was interested in The Office stuck up that no one liked and that counter that is a religious conservative and really into cats. It was just... What the f is your problem? Who drives like... It's not only more fresh than good, normal, cliche relationships, but I also think that it's better than having a cliche bad relationship. Like you could, if you wanted, to write a cliche couple of a guy that is really rich and a woman that is really hot and they're both married for self-interest, they're not really in love with each other, and you could take the easy route and make them very miserable, but you could also take the other route and make them actually respect each other. Like the lady is an absolute gold digger and doesn't love the guy, but she does genuinely respect the fact that he worked hard in his life to get the money. And the guy does respect the fact that his wife spends a lot of effort maintaining her body and genuinely respects her for that. And they just keep cheating on each other, but it's mutual and they don't really mind. And they go on trips together while they're not romantic. They're actually genuinely fun and they enjoy each other's company, discussing how much better than other other people, because first of all, they're not hypocrites. And second of all, their relationship is so much better and healthier than people that marry for love. I just, I love this trip, it's so great.
this one is so focused on TV tropes as a website that you might not be interested in what I have to say. So I am offering you the option to skip this if you want to. Go ahead, I won't be mad. So Lydia Arkin made a video talking about how her Star Wars fan fiction is the ultimate moral compass for all of humanity and I basically gave her a wedgie for 43 minutes. And I didn't actually read the fanfiction because in the video she said I didn't have to. And even if I wanted to waste my time reading bad fanfiction, I would probably do it for a media that I actually like. Yeah, reading that hardcore BDSM gay furry Animal Crossing fanfic. And you people commented a lot about her fanfiction on the comments, which I am very glad. And I decided to check out her TV tropes page on the fanfic because holy shit, what the fuck is going on? Perhaps I should add something to make the protagonist a bit more sympathetic. Like contributing to slavery. Is that really in the script? Yeah, there it is. That can't be real. No one's dumb enough to write that into their story. And I ended up coming across this beautiful trope called Better Than Canon. Better Than Canon is basically one of those things you put on your self-edited TV tropes page to stroke your ego. And honestly, it should be nuked off the site. I obviously didn't read every single work page that has this trope, but I clicked around on the related page and most of that is just ego stroking. Saying that a fanfiction can be better than the original work is already a pretty big thing to imply because a fanfiction is a transformative work that already uses characters and settings established by someone else. So many of the emotional reactions you are getting are emotional reactions based on the original work in the first place. And many fanfiction and fanwork makers don't have to deal with the problems that the original work had to deal with. You have to deal with executives, budget issues, marketing, and I think that it's really unfair for you to imply that some fanfic can be measured as better than the original work that not inspired it, it made the fanfiction. But with that aside, let's take a look at some of the works that have the better than canon tropes stamped right there on their YMMV page. Starting with, of course, the Sith Resurgence. Many elements from the sequel trilogy that were viewed as derisive by the viewers are actively rewritten or challenged by the story, and readers seem to enjoy Orchard's take better. Okay, so far so good. Okay, there's six bullet points. That's insane. Most of the works that I've seen only have one or two, if they have at all. But look at this. The legacy characters have their roles in their story massively downplayed or altered. Han is an advice giving that to Aliana and Finn before his death. Luke has a quasi-redemption story regarding what he'd done to Aliana. Leia is considerably more antagonistic and her character arcs about unpacking her hostility toward the Sith and the way she takes that out on Aliana and Rey. This was written by the author. There is no way that this was written by some reader and I'm going to tell you why. First of all, if you are a reader that is reading Star Wars fanfiction, you Google Star Wars fanfiction and came across this work, you probably enjoy Star Wars and you probably enjoy the legacy characters. So saying that the legacy characters have their roles in their story massively downplayed or altered without explaining exactly how it makes the story better, it's suspicious. But then you have the actual explanation. Here you have Hens and advice giving that to Alien and Finn for his death, he was already there on The Force Awakens. Hey Ray, you can have my ship if you want to and then he dies, that is what happened in the movie. Luke has a quasi-redemption story regarding what he done to Aliana. Aliana is an OC, she doesn't exist in their Star Wars universe. He has a redemption story over something that didn't happen in the originals, how does that make it better? Better than the movie, where the people watching the movies were like, man, I wish someone would create some kind of random character for Luke to kill so he had to have redemption for that. I don't think that this is what went through most people's minds. You have Leia is more antagonistic and her character again is about unpacking something that wasn't there in the first place and I highly doubt that the viewers thought that this needed to happen. If this were written by an actual reader, it probably say this. Many people consider the legacy character should be cliche fantasy tropes and this fanfic gives them a little bit of baggage 
and something should work out. You probably say this and not say, yeah, it's good that Leia is considerably more antagonistic. Who, who would say that, really? But don't get me wrong, this is not the only Your Millage May Vary page that feels like it was written by the author. Here's another one that just blew my mind. And the more optimistic tone, character development, and open-ended but hopeful bitters with any make a strong case for a more enjoyable experience than the original show or review. Really? You're gonna say that it's better than the original Evangelion because it's not depressing, even though that being depressing was kind of the point of the anime, why it was so groundbreaking in the first place. And also, it is optimistic, but maybe it is optimistic and people like it more because they are attached to the characters of the original show and not because of what you've done with them. So you're basically just leeching off the original work anyway. I'm not saying that there aren't uses of this trope that I approve. I actually don't mind it being written on the canon work page by just saying, yeah, this work kind of sucks and there are many fan things that people consider to be better. But honestly, it's not worth it, man. There are so many other tropes that could be used in this place for fan fiction. You could put crowning moment of heartwarming, moment of awesome, tearjerker, alternate character interpretation, adaptation expansion, adaptation distillation. Nuke better than canon. Nobody needs it. If I ever get famous enough to get my fan fiction on TV tropes and you even think about adding better than canon to them, I am going to track down your IP and hit you with my car. I have said that I'm not really a fan of the romance kind of genre. I don't go out of my way to consume romance stories and they just appear on media that I'm consuming. And if you got the impression that I don't really respect romance as a genre, then I think you're kind of right. I would respect it more if it wasn't so shoved in my face. I'm gonna tell you that Batman movie marathon that I did was awful. The consistently bad part in every single movie was the romantic love interest. The only good Batman movie romantic love interest are Catwoman or the lady that isn't actually a romantic love interest. It's everything else just fucking suck. I don't have a problem with the idea that romance equals happy ending, that for you to be happy you need to be with your loved one, or vice versa, being with your loved one means eternal happiness. And I just feel like sometimes it's a cop-out to try to make us feel good about the ending. And I feel like more often than not, it's just not written very well and originally. Like, you can say whatever you want about, oh, childhood friends, oh, enemies to lovers. But the real best romance trope is lovers to enemies. I just love it. I just love a good breakup story. It just subverts the narrative so much. You can do it many ways also. You can make, for example, a person escaping an abusive relationship or just falling in love with someone else that matches their interest better. But I like it better when it's obvious that the writers actually put effort into what they're doing and thought it through and are clearly not taking shortcuts into what they consider a happy ending. I think that the best ones are where the couple just grew apart as people and you can clearly analyze why it happened. You keep dating women in their 20s. I do do that. They're not fully formed yet. Life changes people. Well, not me. That's kind of my point. You don't ruin these women, they just grow up. So what you're saying is, they all grow up, but I stay the same age? Because you also work with your characters a lot. You can clearly work with them and see their flaws and how they don't work with the other person. You don't need to really blame sides here. You can just say, well, nobody's really wrong. They just fell out of love. It just doesn't work anymore. The room, precisely with its unrealistic, biased inaccuracy, accurately depicts why breakups actually happen. People don't fully understand how the other person feels and begin to think of them as malicious figures because that's the only way we can make sense of people when we don't fully understand them. I've talked to plenty of guys about breakups and very often you get the same old story just like this one where their partner turned out to be a crazy bitch who just wanted to hurt them. But if you're ever lucky enough to hear the other side of a story like that, they're often just frustrated with people who can so easily view them like that if they have a few arguments. The Room is a filmed version of the real, heavily distorted perspective on breakups that many heterosexual men often have, and in many ways, when you look at the film this way, 
It serves as a call to action to learn to see past the Lisas we think we see and understand that relationships tend to fall apart for a reason, and we can learn to do better by seeing people for who they are. It's the opposite of the trope in which two characters that don't match each other, have no chemistry at all, are strangled by the red string and fall in love even though they keep bickering at each other for the entire movie. Brazilian viewers will probably remember a video that I made that I talked a little bit about how I don't think getting together with a romantic partner as an automatic happy ending is a good idea, how you can get through everything with the power of love is a good moral. And I called it emotional dependence, that sometimes you need to learn how to stand up on your both feet. Because maybe your lover won't be there forever, even if you don't break up up, he might die one day. And this trope is a pretty good example of how to deal with that. I like that very much. When I was younger, I used to spend a lot of time watching the Big Bang Theory with my parents. <laughs> And me and Laura would sit there on the couch, watching all the jokes and having a good time. But then sometimes they would pop up and say that Aquaman fucking sucks. This before and I'll say it again. Aquaman sucks. And I would get confused because even at that young tender age, I understood that Aquaman was a character that was really old, worth a lot of money and many people liked it. And I thought, man, it surely can't be that bad. It's probably a lazy joke that is poking fun of a character that is more popular and more iconic than anything that these writers will produce in their entire lives. And right now, in the future, I do still hold that opinion. And to make it clear, it's not just Aquaman, it's every other superhero or supervillain that is mathematically a loser, not because the work world is as a loser, but just because they don't like it very much. And it's a joke that is mostly made by people that aren't fans of the character or didn't read the comic. I used to think that even before I started reading comics, but right now, after getting more knowledge on the medium, it's just a lazy joke. Honestly, characters that are kind of losers are the best. Sometimes being overpowered and really strong is a detriment to your character because that means that the hardships you face are entirely your fault because you're not being smart and using your powers. Kind of like every time Superman's in a pinch and you remember he has laser vision that can basically melt anything and you're just like, it's the fucking laser vision, oh my god. Even if you don't agree with me, even if you think that the joke isn't inherently bad, isn't respectful to the characters and the comics, you gotta agree with me that it's starting to get old. The example of me watching The Big Bang Theory was in like 2008. Why, when I watched The Boys in 2020, I am still seeing this joke? It has gotten to the point that it's so old and it's so unfunny that that I would actually rather see them using the character creatively to make them do something cool than just being like, hey, hey, isn't it nice that Aquaman thought he could do something awesome, but it turns out that he couldn't because he's pathetic. Stop, guys, stop. It's not, it's not as good as you think it is. those straight men, am I right? I am not, of course, talking about heterosexual males, I'm talking about the concept in comedy, having in a comedic duo a guy that is just a normal person and reacts normally and coldly to the other person's very wacky shenanigans. It's a squid word and it's not one of my favorite tropes. Saying that the straight man is my favorite trope is like saying that colors in movies are my favorite trope. It is a genre basic building block, you can't say that you like it or hate it. It's just there, it's omnipresent, you have to live with it. What I really like is one thing that I have called the rotating straight man. That's when you have a show with multiple characters and you don't have a set straight man, 
the straight man changes depending on the situation that you're working with. If you have, for example, a duo of characters, one is a warrior that is very good at fighting and the other is a nerdy hacker, there is no reason one of them has to be the straight man. You can have a warrior acting as a straight man to the hacker being really bad at fighting and trying to get out of conflict without hurting anybody because they just suck at fighting. And you can have the hacker acting with disbelief to the fact that the warrior doesn't really know anything about computers or information and they are more stupid in that way. I really like this because it highlights how every single character is unique and has their own strengths and it brings more dynamism to the plot. You can have multiple characters being in multiple situations acting a multiple number of roles. That is probably why I like Batman villains that much. You have the Riddler being like, hoo hoo hoo, I'm Jim Carrey, I make riddles, I have pink hair. Oh my god, you face, you can't just invade my body, what are you, are you crazy? Ah, I love that movie. Okay, this is going to take a while because it's kind of complicated to explain. In manga, it's very common for you to have a very specific type of character that I have called Joker, Isaiah, Bugs Bunny. The one thing that the three characters have in common is that they are kind of trolls. They are slimy little bastards that keep trolling people. Isaiah is not a very physically strong character in the context of the anime that he's in. He has to deal with a lot of strong people and he deals with them by manipulating them and using his brain. The Joker is a Batman villain, it's all about ooh, society, ooh, because we need to be funny people, society doesn't make sense, all we need is chaos. And Bugs Bunny is an invincible troll, basically a trickster. So when you unite all these characteristics into a single character, it becomes the most annoying archetype I have ever seen in my life. It pops up everywhere, it popped up in a gene, Beastars, psychopaths, oh my god! The reason this kind of character sucks is because they're just boring, they're the most boring character you could possibly make. Ooh, I don't like society, I like chaos, I like doing whatever I want. And since he's almost invincible, the story just grinds to a halt because they need to defeat this guy, because he's manipulative, it's manipulating everyone, and they just spend so much time just trying to defeat this fucking piece of shit boring character. I had to quit reading these stars because of this. The story just grinded it to a halt. At least with the other two works, you could claim that that's the entire point of them, that you could see from the beginning that this is what was going to happen. But with Beastars, there's no excuse. It was so boring. It just fucking, it just fucking sucked. By the way, I don't think any of the three characters I have mentioned do fit this archetype. I would rather read a story with any of these three characters and read a story of an Isaiah Joker, Bugs Bunny type of character. This is honestly one of the worst. My god. <laughs> So which one is my favorite trope of all time? Well, for starters, it's a trope that can be used in multiple ways, for comedy, for drama, it's just very versatile. It's also a trope that can really deepen a character and make him more sympathetic and look more human. And it can also reinforce the dramaticity or ridiculousness of an action that has occurred in the plot. I am talking, of course, of everyone has standards. That is just the best trope, I love it. It works in so many levels, you can either have a villain doing something awful and a person that you considered to be bad to just be like, well, this sucks. It can really drive home how bad the situation is and it makes the former bad guy don't look as bad. It can even jumpstart a redemption if you really want to, but it also works as a joke. You have this galactic emperor saying, I have conquered many planets, I have raped many women and used my soldiers as cannon fodder to further my own egocentric selfish goals. But I'm not a racist, what, you think I'm that evil? Jesus! Well, I've talked about my best trope, what about the worst trope, the one that I absolutely hate? Have you ever watched the show 
in which the creators try to argue with the haters. That is not my least favorite trope because I do believe that it can be done well. You can comment on the actions of your haters or your fans in a way that makes sense and is good. It's theoretically possible, even though most times just kind of suck. I remember that I was watching this episode of Harley Quinn and you have this dude that is fat, so you know that he's a bad guy, that he's lazy and sits around all day consuming Batman stuff. You know that because he's fat, he's a bad guy. And then he starts talking that he doesn't like Harley Quinn because it's a Batman show without Batman. And then the dude next to him says, well, but you like Gotham. What, you want your viewers to write a logical essay arguing logically with coherent arguments? Why they dislike your show and send them to you so you can grade them? Really? Gotham is such a different show, the comparison doesn't even work. And then he started talking about an episode arc and the dude is like, wow, you sure watched a lot of Harley Quinn for someone who hates him. Are you sure you haven't seen the show? I hate that part because I am absolutely positively sure that if this fictional character did not watch Harley Quinn, the character would be like, well, but how do you know that you hate it if you didn't watch it? I know this because this happens to me a lot in real life. But that's not what I'm talking about. This is not the trope that I hate. I'm just setting the scene because there is something more pathetic than that. That is when the creators try to argue with the viewers, but they try to argue as if the characters exist. Like they were real people, real humans. I mean, look at the costume they've got you in. Talk about pandering to gender roles. I designed my own costume. And it's just, do I even need to explain this? Do I even need to explain how pathetic it is to try to pretend like your character is a real person and that it's having its feelings really hurt and having your character sing a song about how they're just real people with real flaws as if people are somehow discussing the flaws of a real person that exists. If you don't understand the ridiculousness of the situation, let me just say this. It doesn't work. It never worked. It never will work. You will never stop people from discussing your actual work of art with other people by saying that your character has real feelings. It's just... <sighs> anyway, end of the video. What have we learned? Not much really, it was just a video about my opinions. So what do you think? What are your favorite tropes and more like tropes? It doesn't need to be a TV tropes page, just talk about it on the comments. Say, well, I hate when things like this happen. I love when things like this happen. Just have some fun and see you next video.